Hello, I'm Karen Cater, CEO of Digital Promise, and I'll be your host for today's conversation about advocating for equity in digital learning environments. Thank you so much for joining us. We've received many questions as people registered, and if you have additional questions, please feel free to add them in the Q&A. We have a lot to talk about, so not sure how many questions we'll get to you, get to, but our, your questions are important for our follow-up. So with me today are two top education leaders who I am very pleased to introduce. John King is the president and CEO of Education Trust, a national nonprofit organization that seeks to identify and close educational opportunity and achievement gaps. John King served as the US Secretary of Education in the Obama administration, and he joined the department following his post as the New York State Education Commissioner. He began his career as a high school social studies teacher and a middle school principal. Also joining us today is Superintendent Robert Renzi. He joined Broward County Public Schools in 2011. He has focused the district's strategic priorities on three key areas, high quality instruction, continuous improvement, and effective communication. The district's graduation rate is the highest it's been in, seven, is the highest in seven years, and the advanced placement pass rates are the highest in a decade. Broward County High Schools also consistently rank among the best in the nation by US News and World Report. And in 2018, Broward County Public Schools became the first district to, in the United States to receive the Cambridge District of the Year distinction. You can read their full bios online. Welcome to you both. And please, if you haven't already, I see you have, unmute yourselves and, uh, and we'd love to see you on video. So you can both unmute yourselves at this point. Thanks. So I am so pleased to be able to converse with you for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. But um, first, you know, I, I really wanted to start by recognizing the context of this webinar. When we plan this, we don't quite know what's going to be happening at the time it actually occurs. So recognizing the context, difficult current events, as well as the uh, awful history that is, has led us here. It's been an exceedingly uh, difficult week, which is an understatement with the horrific death of George Floyd, the ensuing unrest, the protests, the uneasiness across the country. And this has piled on so many more incidents, including a month's, multiple month long shutdown, including of our nation's schools due to COVID-19, a disease that has disproportionately affected people of color. So I guess to start, I'm hoping that you could each share kind of some opening thoughts and your perspectives uh, with our listeners. So John, you wanna, you wanna jump in and start? Sure. Well, thanks, Karen, for the opportunity to join this conversation and, and always love to be in conversation with Bob and hearing about the great work in Broward County. I, you know, this, this is a painful moment for the country. And I think it's important that we contextualize the murder of George Floyd in what is really a 400 plus year history. Um, you know, our nation has not yet fully grappled with the legacy of slavery, Jim Crow, redlining. And you see that not only in uh, issues of policing, but you see that in education too. And so we, I think as educators, have a responsibility both to educate our students, white students and students of color, about the historical context for this moment. We have an obligation to support our teams, our colleagues, <laughs> who are bearing the weight of this moment, um, particularly colleagues of color who are, as we are in our family, just grappling with the pain and the fear of this moment and the frustration that we are here again. Uh, and we have an obligation, I think, to interrogate our own practices as a sector and to ask whether it's uh, whether, or, whether or not our discipline policies are having a disparate impact on students of color, to ask whether our hiring policies are resulting in a genuinely diverse educator workforce. We know the majority of kids of color in the nation's public schools, uh, majority of our kids in the nation's public schools are kids of color, only 18% of our teachers are teachers of color. We have a responsibility to ask, is our curriculum reflective of the uh, diversity that we value? Do kids have an opportunity to see windows and mirrors in the curriculum? 
Um, and we, so we have to interrogate our own practices and hold ourselves accountable for what we in the education sector are doing either to protect and preserve uh, oppressive systems or rather what we're doing to dismantle institutional racism. Uh, so this is no question a challenging moment, but it's, it's deeply connected to what's going on outside is deeply connected to what's going on inside of schools, our virtual classrooms, our school districts, and hopefully uh, this conversation will center issues of racial equity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, thank you, uh, Karen, for being here. And um, yeah, I just want to echo what John said. It's a pleasure to uh, certainly be here with you today and to have this uh, conversation and the context of which we have this conversation is always important, right? Because our schools um, ultimately end up being reflection of society, um, what's going on out in our communities and the values um, in that community actually are reflected in school boards, policies and practices. Um, so yes, this is a, a, a kind of a watershed uh, moment, I believe, um, for the country um, to have a real type of courageous conversation that we haven't had, right? That we've seen um, successfully move forward in other countries um, such as Germany after the Holocaust, South Africa um, with apartheid, um, Rwanda with genocide. These countries have had these conversations honestly and reflected on them and figure how to move forward. Um, we've been carrying around this albatross on the backs uh, of generations in this country trying to deal with this whole issue of race and inequity. Um, that's part of it and the narratives that are put forth on that. Um, and it really is impacting, I would say, white folks as much as it is black folks. And it may not always be the economic piece, but there's a whole psychological burden that goes along with maintaining a system um, that effectively terrorizes a part of its um, population. And so um, it's, it's a definitely a moment that we, we need to have. And I think these issues are reflected in how we look at school system. The inequities translate there as well. Um, in Florida, for example, our per student funding um, is around $7,600 dollars per student here in Broward County, where about 63% of our kids qualify for free reduced meals. And you can go elsewhere um, in this country and you can find kids being funded at a level of 30,000 or more. So you see huge inequities in resources, funding, um, the, the whole way we treat the teaching profession is a problem, right? Um, they're underpaid. Um, there's so many regulations on it. And hence, we don't always, we've got good hardworking people, but the pipeline shrinking and we don't always get the best people um, coming out of our institutions of higher learning that will go into our urban systems to teach because they, they, they just don't exist. Um, so there's so many structural issues that need to be addressed that perpetuates the system we have. And I don't think that people understand the extent of how um, ingrained and wrapped up structures and policies are all the way from federal, state, and local government that perpetuate the system that's there, even if the populace wants it changed. Um, so there's gotta be a real intelligent look at this. And I'm, you know, I'm encouraged by um, the generation of young folks that we um, have coming up that um, this graduating class, the one before them and, and the ones to come, um, I believe will have a unique opportunity to address um, these issues which have not been adequately addressed in our generations and past generations, um, they're going to have to deal with it. It's, it's really coming to a head. Um, not only this, but there are issues out there like climate change, um, mm -hmm. access to health care. It's all wrapped up in the same psyche and narrative, and we need to figure out how we actually live up to the ideals and values in which this country was actually founded under, because we have not met that yet. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and um, I want to circle back to the the question about the pipeline in a little in a little bit here. But um, you know, maybe one of you know you've raised multiple issues around equity in education, um, and we can take up any of those that you would like to spend a little more time on. Um, 
is there any anything else either one of you before we move to kind of thinking specifically about the digital divide or should we jump into digital divide yeah, yeah we could jump into that and see yeah, where see where it goes yeah okay. yeah that's very good okay so the country uh you know transitioned as we all know and for our for our listeners as well to either home-based digital learning home-based paper learning or nothing at all um if we consider that having access um you know, is, is critical to um, the best possible learning environment. If we understand the affordances that technology provides in staying connected to each other in staying, um, you know, all of the things that we know people have been able to do if students have had access at home. Um, how would you describe what you're seeing across the country with regard to access to digital learning as schools have closed? Um, John, what are, what are some examples or what have you seen kind of across the country? Yeah. I'll start. I'll, I'll, I'll start with the the stark reality, and then I'll try to highlight some positives. I think the stark reality is that this, this is really an equity crisis for the country. D distance learning has both revealed and exacerbated long-standing inequities, mm -hmm. and it operates at every level. Low-income students and students of color were less likely to have devices. We had a device gap before. We came into this crisis with a device gap. And by a device gap, I don't mean just, is there a computer in the house? It's a question of, is there a computer that every child in the home can use simultaneously to do their schoolwork? Mm -hmm. We had an um, internet access gap. Of course, high needs rural communities without access to bandwidth, but also bandwidth challenges in high needs suburban and urban communities and cable companies that say, if you have an unpaid balance, you don't get to have internet or cable companies that require a slew of information to get internet access such that undocumented students and mixed status families are afraid to sign up for internet service. So we knew we had a 20 percentage point gap for students of color and white students in internet access before, but now that internet access is equivalent to the schoolhouse door. We then had inequities in districts <laughs> to transition to distance learning. Some places where there was a learning management system in place and professional development and teachers were familiar with the tools and other places, particularly under resource school districts, where there was none of that foundation and people are expected to move instruction online overnight. We then have a parent support gap. If you look at the African-American workforce, only about one in five African-Americans in the workforce can work from home. Only about one in six Latinos in the workforce can work from home. And so a lot of the media conversation is about how challenging it is for the two teleworking parents to blend being on Zoom calls themselves with supporting their kids. And believe me, that is challenging. I get it. I'm, I'm experiencing it. My colleagues are experiencing it. But actually, that's tremendous privilege. There are a lot of families where kids are at home alone, or maybe they're home with an older sibling or another family member, but they're not, their parents are not able to be home with them because they're out working. And so that, that, is, that is a real challenge, that, that inequity in parent support. And then of course, there's very different socio-emotional context. Some kids are in families where they're experiencing economic trauma. Uh, they're in families where there are real health challenges and we know there are huge health disparities for COVID-19. Uh, they're in families where uh, maybe there's abuse or addiction, or domestic violence, and all of that is taking a toll on kids. So that's the landscape of inequity in which we're operating. Now, there are people doing heroic work. There are school districts that are doing incredible work to get meals to kids. There are uh, school districts like San Antonio, a very high poverty district that bought thousands of devices and got them to kids. There are districts like uh, Highline in Washington State that distributed uh, thousand or more hotspots to try to get internet access. Uh, there are districts like Austin, uh, Texas that are putting Wi-Fi hotspots on buses and parking the buses in communities where there's a lack of internet access. So people are doing heroic work to try to get opportunity to kids. Um, but we have to be real, this, this is a equity crisis and it will have enduring consequences, both in terms of learning loss and the socio-emotional impact on kids. Lots to unpack there and, and talk about um, that whole landscape of inequity. Um, 
Yeah. yeah. Take us on your journey. Like um, I was following uh, Broward County on Twitter during the, you know, those early days where it was like overnight people were figuring stuff out and like, thank goodness the education profession is full of very creative souls that have figured stuff out and made do, you know, across, across, uh, you know, years and years. Um, but take us on your journey. What, what did you do as schools closed and how did your, your, and your team manage that? You know, so in, in Broward, uh, we were in a very different position because several years ago, uh, we made some huge investments in developing a learning management system that John alluded to. Um, so the majority, over 50% of our teachers are already doing blended online learning. We had a secured environment um, that we had all our teachers and students log into um, uh, each day. Um, they would then be placed into a dashboard. Uh, one of those was Canvas, uh, which is our main uh, platform for learning management. Um, they would go in there, you effectively are in a virtual class, teachers would post assignments, um, students would get access to digital resources, they would um, submit their coursework. So there was a lot of that going on, in particular at the um, secondary level. Um, so we had somewhere over 60% of our high school um, teachers were actually doing some type of online learning, about 50% at the middle school. And when you got to the elementary school, it, was, it dropped. It was like 19%. So that's where the heavy lift for us came on. But we didn't go and scramble and try to find infrastructure, cut deals with vendors. Everything was already in place. All we had to do was scale it. The second um, the thing that we had worked on over the um, past few years is making sure there was equity in this system relative to access to technology. So when I got here in 2011, the student to computer ratio was six to one, but you know, these averages kind of hide things, right? So we had some schools, it was 10, 15 to one, the computers were like really non-functional. Um, so uh, we did a bond referendum, used a portion of those dollars and made a huge investment in the technology infrastructure and computers. Um, purchased um, well over 100,000 devices uh, that we distributed out to our schools in addition to what we already had. Um, we effectively reduced the student to computer ratio from the six to one um, to less than two to one. It's almost one to one. And that was done across every single school in this system. Um, then when the, um, we shut down our schools and we announced that on March 13th, um, we immediately put a device distribution program in place because our view was like, why are we sitting on these things in our, class, in our schools when the kids need to use them at home? So we didn't ask any questions. You didn't have to give us a free and reduced lunch form or anything else. You just had to be a student in Broward County and you could have multiple students living in the same home. Everybody could get a computer. So we've distributed to date almost 100,000 computing devices to anyone that wants one. We've got a whole support structure around that. Um, we do recognize that there are families that can't afford the access, so that was the next piece. So like some districts around the country, we negotiated deals with Comcast. They have their Comcast Internet Essentials, which is $9.95 per month. The first uh, couple months are free. Uh, we then structured a similar deal with AT&T for about $5 a month. And that's still a challenge for some. So we have then, um, in our own budget, secured thousands of mobile hotspots. And we have delivered those to students with housing insecurity, our homeless students, or those that are having serious financial challenges. So they always have internet connectivity, no matter where they're at. So we try to close some of the gap in access to resources that way. Um, the next piece of it, which districts have had challenges with around the country, you know, as I mentioned to you, um, we, yeah, even though we had a majority of teachers that were familiar with this environment, the ones that weren't, um, getting them up to speed fairly quickly, um, that certainly was a challenge. And so you have disparities out there and it cuts across any type of racial or economic lines. It basically is teachers having a comfort level to do online connections with kids versus just posting an assignment um, or sending some worksheets home. Um, our, especially our young students, they need to have some type of interaction 
um, uh, to connect with their teachers. Um, I have, have got all kinds of stories from parents of how significant that is for their kids. Some kids that can't even sleep at night because they're so anxious and can't wait to get online to um, see their teachers. And then at the other end of the spectrum, um, and in particular for our special needs students, where some of that is so important to not have a teacher actually do any type of um, video conferencing, video chatting, um, is really detrimental to that child's development. So we've been working hard to address that, um, put things in place to provide the right kind of training and support. Um, we know it's been a big, heavy lift for um, teachers early on, uh, but we're, you know, we're, we're moving um, past, past that. So those are um, some of the pieces that we did. And of course, like many districts, we've been distributing food, our food and nutrition services workers, they're some of our lowest paid people, but like what we've seen in this country, they become your essential employees. They're on the front line. They're almost like 99% minority folks, folks of color um, that are out there that are doing it and putting themselves at risk each and every day. Um, they've done a yeoman's job and they've delivered uh, and distributed over 2 million meals to date um, to our communities. And we've made a decision to not only provide food to students to show up, but to families. I mean, we can't tell the parents that they can't eat. Um, so we, we have to, had to provide that as well. Um, so that's been um, another part of our strategy. I do want to hit on one thing that um, John uh, mentioned, which is, um, um, and I was looking at the survey we just did. So we're doing two types of surveys in Broward County. One, which is going on now, that ends tomorrow, is getting a sense from parents, hey, when we open school, we, are, are you interested in actually sending your kid back to school based on your comfort level and your confidence and what's going on? And what are the different kinds of education platforms you would like and the different modalities? So we're trying to get a sense from that. But if, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we did another survey around how this distance learning was working and what the mental health impacts have been on teachers and students and staff. You know, many districts don't do that because they don't want to deal with this data, but we feel that it's absolutely important for us to be honest about what's going on. And so one of the data points I have, and by the way, we had over 65,000 responses to this, right? Over 20,000 students, 20 something thousand parents, um, and a little over 10,000 staff primarily instructional staff. But 45% of the students, almost half, said that they're taking care of somebody else, either um, a sibling or, or it could be a grandparent or somebody at home. So to John's point, not all of these kids are equally situated. So yeah, I got you a device. I got you internet access. And, and hopefully your teachers, like, you know, you've got a good quality teacher who's doing some of these online things with you. But you got other kids and others in the home and you're trying to actually deal with that. that. That came to the fore recently when we had an online debate tournament going on. And one of the students there was when she was up to you know, do her presentation, the little sister came in and decided that was the time that she was gonna have some fun. And it really kind of disrupted the whole thing, but obviously we got to give her some grace and we understand the situation. But um, yeah, there's a lot of challenges um, out there. So again, even when you provide equal access to everything, the home piece is not as well situated. And finally, I would say, um, you know, I lose sleep about it this at night, thinking about the students who are in um, what I call unstable home situations. And no matter how good we do distance learning, no matter how many resources we provide, the longer they're out of our school environment or in homes, that's a problem. So we've stepped up communication around our child abuse hotline, making sure people are reporting that. Um, teachers continue to look for signs now that they have a little bit of a bird's eye view into um, some of the homes. Uh, but I, I think we've got to be cognizant of that. And as this economic situation deteriorates and puts additional pressure and challenges on families that were already stressed, that these kids now become collateral you know, damage for some of these um, families going through this. So we, we've got to be um, cognizant of that. And that's why I'm pretty adamant that we've got to find a way that we open up schools in the fall, even if I can't do the full population of students every day on campus, 
we got to find some way that students get some time during a week where they're physically on our campuses with teachers and adults. Yeah, and we'll talk more. I definitely want to get back to the, the reopening of schools and kind of what some ideas are. You know, it's interesting, way back to the beginning of what you just said, the, in 2010 in the National Education Technology Plan, it did call for uh, a device for every student, like making, making sure that every student had access to a device so that they could actually um, do, their, do their work, keep their portfolios, keep, you know, have the affordances that, um, that students yeah, that, need, that needs to be a national priority now because yeah. we're going to go into this coming year and part of the whole entire year, I don't care what district you're in, you're going to be doing some element of this. So if we've yeah. learned anything from this is that just yeah. as we would have a physical school building, you need to have a access to technology and a laptop for every child. Absolutely, absolutely. And then one of the other things um, you were talking about teachers, and then John, I'd love to hear kind of what some of the things that you're seeing across the country. Um, we've also seen that um, districts or schools that have coaches um, have also been kind of set up um, in a good way because teachers are already have somebody to reach out to that can help them like sort things out and figure out how to do things. Um, but John, I'd love to turn to you and what, um, what are some things that you're seeing across the country? You, you have uh, such a good view of, of so many uh, places. What, what are some of the things that you're seeing? So a few things that I'm, I'm hopeful about. One is, you know, to, to Bob's last point about the, the kids who are most vulnerable, who are in sort of un unstable home situations. I think the connection between kids and an adult at school is just essential. Just someone who helps kids feel seen and cared about. Mm -hmm. And so I think about Phoenix Union High School District in Arizona, where they have a Every Student Every Day campaign. They've mobilized every adult in the district, central office staff, non-teaching staff, to make sure that every adult is matched to a student advisory so that every student is in touch with an adult every day. And the idea is that those adults are checking in with them. They are finding out if they need something, food, Wi-Fi, academic support, and they're, they're then able to roll that information up to the central office so that they can get supports to kids. So that connection, critical. Um, two, you know, we're, we're seeing districts that are um, being, I think, creative around how do we do distance learning well. So I think about Baltimore City, which in a subset of their districts, uh, Dr. Centralisis, the superintendent there, is experimenting with having a single teacher do the asynchronous lesson. So you might have a fourth grade team. The fourth grade teacher, who maybe is the strongest presenter in an asynchronous format, is recording a video of the instruction and then the other teachers on the team are able to use their time after students have watched that asynchronous video to work with students on their individual work. I think that's creative and, and a smart way to start to think about how do we leverage talents across our team, similar to your point about coaches. Mm -hmm. We are seeing folks starting to think about the return to school and what that might look like. I, I was struck recently that yeah. Uh, the, uh, in, in California at a, a county middle school, San Jose County Middle School, uh, or San Jose Middle School, uh, which is in Martin County, uh, they are beginning to get students with disabilities from across the county uh, to school. Very small class size, very intensive adult to student ratio. But their view was students with disabilities needed additional support. And so they're doing all the things necessary to try to protect public health. You know, they're doing temperature checks with students. They're maintaining physical distancing. They're dis using disinfectant on, it, on every surface to make sure that they protect kids and staff in terms of public health. But they are getting those students instruction now and support now to try to address their needs. And we know some of our international peers are also doing that, starting the return to school with a subset of students who are particularly vulnerable. And I think that's, that's, part, of, that's part of how we have to begin to think about what the next you know, few months looks like. Yeah. So Rob, um, by the way, somebody in the Q&A wants to know how you got that many responses to your survey. Any quick, quick answer to that? 
Uh, you know, just a, just a lot of um, communications. Uh, for example, I do a weekly video I put out at the end of each week on the status of the district. So that's sent out to all parents. I put reminders there. Uh, we've done parent links, robo calls. I've done, um, you know, those type of uh, messages to make sure everybody is aware um, that it's there. And so that's worked well. I know on the new survey that we just put out, um, last time I checked, after three days, we had over 20,000 um, responses to it, um, which is interesting. We're seeing somewhere um, from that initial list, about a th only about a third of the parents actually are receptive to the idea of opening up campuses and everybody going back. Um, so we're going to look at that closely, and those expectations are going to certainly set uh, where we're at. But hey, communication in this um, climate, absolutely essential. You can't do enough of it. Well, and I appreciated that you are, uh, you are one of your three priorities is effective communication, which, which you know, that, that is huge, especially in a time like this when everything's different than what people are expecting. Figuring out ways of telling them what to expect and everything seems, seems quite, quite critical. Um, so we have a summer now. If everybody's noticed, it's, um, it's and, and uh, I think in Broward, it's actually your last day of school, but we have summer right now. What are ways that people can be thinking about how to, how to use the summer to kind of reskill, retool, plan for, kind of step back after kind of this spring was emerging and now kind of having the opportunity to step back and what do you think would be some of the best uses of this summer time frame for, uh, for making sure that we're set up for success in the fall? assuming that there's going to be some sort of a hybrid model, some closures, some opening, some very um, um, So a couple of things. So first, um, we know that um, this distance learning um, certainly hasn't been perfect. It's not going to replace having our schools open. So there's definitely some academic loss that has occurred over the last three months. You couple that with the traditional, quote, summer slide, and you got a perfect storm of a widening achievement gap occurring, right? So um, we're trying to do everything we can to go mitigate that. So number one, um, we haven't, you know, collected all those computer devices, mobile hotspots. They're going to continue those until we reopen school. Um, secondly, uh, we're going to hold summer school, uh, having some of our traditional um, summer schools, for example, our third graders who are level ones and level twos, um, those are kind of state mandated pieces. And then we've got some enrichment ones going. Uh, but there's a new initiative we're putting in place um, called um, Reclaim and Elevate. Um, and we're targeting some specific communities um, that are economically um, challenged communities. Uh, we're, <clears throat> we're, um, we're training teachers, making sure that uh, we have some of our best teachers um, who are um, have a lot of experience and confidence in doing delivery of online um, uh, learning and having them work with these scholars uh, to provide enriching opportunities over the summer. So we want that to continue. Um, for our youngest learners, literacy is key. Uh, we are distributing um, right now as we speak um, about 240,000 books to uh, students in, in our, from kindergarten to um, second grade. Um, and those, that's a deal we worked out with Scholastic. So they'll, each student will get a package of five books, a journal and a parent guide. Um, and you know, it's kind of helped them to have a home library, but continue um, to, to do reading. But the summer is not shut down for us. So there's that piece going on. And then there's all the planning work to yeah. go into next year. Um, and as, as John just mentioned, you know, one of the things that we've got to think through um, for some of our students, um, for example, our special needs students or those who are um, having academic challenges, you know, do we have them come back a couple weeks earlier? You know, what does that model look like? You know, just to kind of get them caught up as much as we, we can. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about social and emotional um, learning and the juxtap, you know, the kind of the two mm -hmm. elements. Um, as students come back, they'll have various levels of anxiousness and varied experiences. Yeah. That had yeah. so, right. And, you know, so based on that survey I mentioned to you, I can tell you a couple other um, data points. 
and it was really interesting to see, I think it was something uh, around close to 18% of parents felt that their kids needed mental health, social, emotional um, supports. I, I also found it interesting that about a quarter of uh, one, in, one in four of our um, instructional staff said they feel that their mental health is being impacted by all this. So my thinking, um, just looking at this data, is that the first week to week and a half of school can't be like any other traditional opening. Um, I want us to dedicate that time to uh, mental health and social emotional learning reset, where that is the focus for the first couple of weeks, assessing where all the students are at um, and providing uh, support with our social workers, um, our, our school counselors, our, our psychiatrists, behavior specialists, our mental health professionals, um, they need to be in full force um, and uh, working to uh, support um, students uh, during that first uh, week or two of school. Yeah. John, other thoughts about reopening schools and specifically around trauma and understanding where, um, where students are, are at? Um, kind of that, those uh, two things. Yeah. Um, well, a few thoughts. So w one is uh, just to build on, on a point that Bob made about Kind of the teachers who have who are strongest at using the technology to accomplish distance learning. I I think it's almost inevitable that there will be some students who will be participating in distance learning next year. That there will be a hybrid, whether that's because you have a alternating day or alternating week schedule with kids with pre-existing health conditions who can't be in the classroom or particularly vulnerable to COVID. Uh, so we we know there's going to be a, a hybrid experience. We have to get better at teaching with the technology. Uh, it's one thing when you had to do it overnight, but now we've got the benefit of the summer. So we need to do professional development. We need to have teachers who really found successful strategies with online learning, do support for their peers. We need intentional planning around how to help kids do work asynchronously. So what does it mean to give a kid an independent assignment where they have to set goals, manage their time, ask questions when they need help, act on feedback. And those are all skills that need to be yeah. taught, particularly for uh, younger students. Uh, but really even at the middle and high school level, those are still skills that need to be taught. And so helping teachers plan for the school year, that professional development work, critical. Um, I think it's exactly right that the socio-emotional needs are gonna be great. And one worry I have is what's going to happen with resources. Um, oh. You know, we, we are seeing states now projecting 10, 15, 20, 25% cuts in state aid. I mean, that, that, that will be devastating for districts. I and mean, that's, that's hundreds of thousands of layoffs. That's program elimination. And often in those contexts, it's the counselors, the social workers, the mental health supports that are eliminated in those budget crises. So I think one of the things we've got to do at the, at the local and state level, but particularly at the federal level as an education sector is advocate for more resources. We need state stabilization funds from Congress so that states and districts are protected from these cuts. But we also need targeted funding for addressing learning loss, like the after school, the intensive tutoring, and dedicated funding for socio-emotional and mental health needs. We know this crisis is having an impact on kids and staff well-being. So we, we need additional resources to address that. Uh, there are certainly proposals in Congress around this, but we need action. And I think you know, and I'm sure Bob can speak to this for Broward, but one of the challenges that we're hearing a lot from a lot of superintendents is a <laughs> real challenge planning for next school year, because if you're planning with 25% less in state aid, that is a very different, much yeah. more challenging scenario. And so the sooner Congress acts and the sooner states and state legislatures and governors act, to give districts clarity on their resources, uh, that'll be really important because some of the things that districts need to do have a real cost. If you have to run multiple bus routes, that's a cost. If you have to get personal protective equipment for 
teachers and staff, that's a cost. If you have masks that you're going to distribute to kids, that's a cost. You need equipment to do temperature checks, that's a cost. You need to shrink class size uh, in order to maintain physical distancing or go to, to alternating schedules. All of that will have costs. And so I'm really worried that people aren't attending to the, the financial crisis for education that is mm -hmm. resulting from COVID-19. Yeah. There's a lot. And so I have one last question for Rob, and then I'd love to ask you each about one thing that gives you hope. Um, but Rob, so today is your district's last day of school. So you have seniors who are graduating. Um, how are you, what are you doing? Anything today supporting some seniors? What's happening there? Uh, yeah, I've, I've gone to, like, we have a student representative on our school board. So I went to his house along with the principal and some other administrators. Um, you know, we were dressed in our our um, graduation regalia, and uh, we present them a diploma, um, some gifts um, throughout the county, uh, through you know our municipalities and others. Um, similar type of things are going on uh, with students. Unfortunately, uh, we're not able to hold um, you know in-person traditional graduation ceremonies. They will be virtual, uh, but we're you know we we contracted with an entity. Uh, we're going to make them as nice and as memorable um, as possible. So, um, you know, that's where we are with the, the graduating class. Uh, but, you know, the end of this school year, it's, it's, it, it, it just feels, you know, very different. Um, in some ways, I don't really kind of feel that it's ending because there's a lot of work uh, that needs to be done over the summer and preparing and going into the next year. I mean, we are literally rebuilding and restructuring our entire education model in such a short window of time. Um, and that, that's an enormous amount of work and focus that we're on. We've got, um, you know, principals, teachers, um, everyone is focused on this um, right now because we, you know, we've got, we can't get back to any sense of normalcy. The country's economy will not reopen to the level it needs to unless our schools are in a position to function. And unless those funds come that John was referring to, we're gonna have a huge problem. And let me just say this, I mean, there's a game going on in states, right? And it's around the politics of this is an election year. So, I mean, I can tell you in Florida, the legislature is not meeting. They're not going to, because this year's financial impact is minimal. Right, so they don't really need to meet for that. The issue is what's gonna happen in the next year's budget. And they've already passed those budgets, but they're not meeting to recalibrate the cuts that have been estimated. So as John has mentioned, we had a, a Moody's report that came out um, in April 15th that indicated that the state of Florida could see a 25% reduction in revenues. Well, they've made no adjustment to that. We believe that what's gonna happen is they're gonna wait till after the November election and then when January, we're going to see a mid-year cut that we're going to have to cut like 20% or more, which is going to feel like a 50% cut at that point. Um, yeah. So we are trying to anticipate that going on. Now, that's the worst case scenario if we get no funding from the federal government. So we've asked, um, John knows and has participated in this through the Council of Great City Schools, for example, we submitted a letter to Congress. We're asking for about $200 billion for our public schools. That may seem like a lot, and it is, but if you put it in the perspective of 2008 during a Great Recession, there was a hundred billion, uh, over a hundred billion allocated to schools. To date, we've only seen 13 billion for K-12, and we know that we're way beyond the financial impacts of 2008. So to not even receive the level of support that we had in 2008, and cuts were made back then, right? Um, we lost music programs, teachers. We lost 1,400 teachers in Broward County as a result of that. Um, it is imperative that the public school system in this country be the focus of any type of um, stimulus recovery strategy that this country has. To not do that is going to be a huge mistake. Yeah, thank you. So we are over time actually, but I just can't, I wanna end with maybe even just a sentence from each of you about one thing that gives you hope. 
Um, I would say, you know, this is a moment where a lot of stuff is breaking and in order to fix stuff and move forward, sometimes you got to go break the system. Um, COVID has put us all in a position to re-examine our priorities, identify fissures and holes in our, in, in our, in our society, right? Those folks who are falling through the cracks, students that don't have access to technology, resources, um, quality instruction, um, access to health care. Um, it's shown where our most vulnerable people are. Um, and so I think this is a moment for us to capitalize on and figure out how we move forward and come out better on the other end. Um, this country's always gone through major crises every so many decades. Um, and through those crises, um, with the right kind of leadership, and that's probably the thing I probably worry about the most. But if you have the right kind of leadership, you can come out on the other end probably better than where you are. I'm somewhat concerned about where we are on the leadership level to get that done, but I believe in the power of the people, and I think they'll step up. Yeah, well, you two as leaders give me hope. Um, John, one last thing that gives you hope. Um, so one idea and, and one closing thought. The idea is uh, Northern Virginia Community College in uh, uh, right here in, in, in neighboring Virginia, they are offering free online summer courses for all high school juniors and seniors in their region. They're using federal stimulus dollars to do that. Uh, and they're offering courses that are high engagement, high interest topics for high school students. It strikes me as a very smart model and I hope more places around the country will try to do that to accelerate, not just remediate uh, this summer. And then a final thought, just, just to build on Superintendent Runcie's point. Um, you know, I taught high school social studies. I think a lot about the Great Depression and the New Deal. And you had this moment uh, of incredible despair for the country, but out of it, through leadership, came the Social Security Act, came a revisiting of our social safety net and a willingness to say uh, that we needed to do more to support our fellow Americans. And I hope that this is a New Deal moment, a moment where we finally address the education equity issues that we have, but also the equity challenges we have in our economy, in healthcare, in housing, and access to food. And this really could be a pivot point towards a more just future. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for your leadership. Um, I really um, appreciated your um, sharing your perspectives, your knowledge of education, as well as your wisdom. Uh, we are all better for it. And thank you to our listeners. This webinar is, um, was based on a report that Digital Promise and EdTrust produced together that might be helpful to you. 10 questions for equity advocates to ask about distance learning. We'll be posting the recording of this webinar along with this resource online and we'll let you know when it's available. This webinar is the first in a series uh, funded by the Wallace Foundation focused particularly on our schools and the role of the principal. These will run throughout the summer and next week please join me for a conversation with National Association of Secondary School Digital Principals of the Year, Brian McCann and Allison Prasad next Tuesday, June 9th, 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. I'm Karen Cater, signing off. Thank you very much. <laughs>